The following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. In Chicago, a beautiful January day is about as rare as a Republican mayor. January 24th, 1967 was one of those rare days. 60 degree temperatures gave the city a brief respite from a typically frigid winter. I think it's part of the, uh, the daily routine in winter around here that you, you realize somewhere in the back of your head that one of these big storms may in fact be lurking off in the distance and, and upon you before you know it. The next day, temperatures dropped and the forecast for Thursday, January 26, promised a return to normal winter weather. WCFL weather cloudy today with a chance of snow tonight, possibly one to two inches by tomorrow morning. In the early morning hours of January 26, the forecast was changed, four inches of snow. By the time the morning rush hour started, the snow was coming down fast and the forecasts were changing. Uh, the forecast has been revised now. We, uh, we expect around 15 inches of snow and uh, I hope there's no more. I headed down to the, uh, the loop in my car and had the radio on and listened as I was coming down and sort of indicated that it was heavier than it uh, had been forecast. Uh, nobody, of course, at that point uh, anticipated 23 inches. But 23 inches is what the city got. Falling as fast as one inch every hour, the snow caught the city completely off guard. 50 mile an hour gusts created whiteout conditions on the roads. For suburbanites, as well as city residents, the word is don't travel unless it's an absolute emergency. Uh, the outer drive is completely closed, and there are a few deserted cars there, and they have snow up to the hood. So uh, it's uh, pretty bad here. The snow finally stopped coming down just after 10 a.m. on January 27th, more than 29 hours after it began. 50,000 cars and 800 buses were abandoned on the city streets. The only way to survey Chicago's plight was from the air. I flew over Chicago and it was twice as bad as I expected. I mean, I had get reports all night long from ward superintendents, but nothing was moving. Uh, it was a shock. Attempts to clear the roads were hindered by a catch-22 situation. No cars could be moved until plows got through, but no plows could get through all the cars. Imagine the problems in cleaning snow on a workday in a major urban area, but then complicate it by putting a, thousands of vehicles out there that folks simply just abandoned because they couldn't go any farther, even on the big uh, highways and thoroughfares. They would go in and uh, try to plow and find out that they had a Volkswagen underneath it. It was unbelievable. They actually did plow right over cars and take off bumpers trying to get them out with the, uh, with the heavy snow. I remember seeing people walking down the Dan Ryan because their cars were just stuck in a huge train of stopped cars. You could walk the Dan Ryan for two miles. Some took advantage of the city's paralysis. Stores and stranded trucks became targets for looters. This looting occurred on the west side predominantly. A 10-year-old girl, Dolores Miller, was shot to death as police exchanged gunfire with some looters in a shoe store on West Roosevelt Road. More than 200 looters, including one Chicago cop, were arrested in the days after the storm. Across the city, thousands were trapped in schools, firehouses, and factories where they had taken refuge during the night. Any food or medicine would have to come in from the air. Nearly every helicopter in the city was pressed into service. At one South Side firehouse, choppers were dispatched to remove the body of a man who had died there during the night. When he passed away, they just put him out in the snow is what they did. So we responded when we had the extra time and set him up in the helicopter and tied him in and off he went. We flew the body out to Midway Airport while waiting a uh, hearse. And when the pilot came back, he said the passenger didn't mind the ride at all. <laughs> As the digging out process went on, Chicago's notorious politics came into play. 
Neighborhoods with powerful aldermen expected their streets to be clean sooner. <laughs> that was always a problem. If you, uh, if uh, you know, a ward superintendent would ask uh, for trucks to be sent to, uh, as an example, maybe the, the Tom Keene's ward uh, over on the west side or, or somebody else's ward, they, uh, they went there. If they were sent to a ward that perhaps wasn't as influential, they got way late on the way and got over to a different ward. We were constantly fighting that battle. Chicagoans pride themselves on not letting winter get them down. As the immediate danger passed, what had been a life-threatening disaster became something of a holiday. Schools were closed, workers took days off, and neighbors pitched in to help one another out. This whole thing was dumped on us so, so quickly and in some ways so beautifully that there was, there was almost a surreal quality. And, and there was uh, an almost festive quality uh, if you were not directly doing something miserable like trying to dig your car out. One person who emerged unscathed from the storm was the city's three-term mayor and political boss, Richard J. Daley. A master politician, Daley made sure to stress that the city had done everything it could and that people needed to pitch in themselves. Of course, with a storm of this magnitude, it's going to take some time. Again, we ask all the people for their cooperation and their help and their assistance. I think the, the mayor was uh, smart enough to say, you know, this is a natural disaster and we're going to have to live through it and let's be calm. So they were. Two months after the blizzard, Daly was re-elected in a landslide to a fourth term. The city's handling of the snow wasn't even an issue in the campaign. Twelve years later, winter would not be so kind to Chicago's political machine. Take it up with the commissioner. Chicago's 1967 blizzard was the worst single snowstorm ever to hit the city. Twelve years later, however, the city would be battered by a month-long winter siege. The story of the 1979 blizzards would eventually become the story of a political dynasty's downfall. January 1979. For three consecutive winters, Chicago had been in the grip of unprecedented Arctic cold. An analysis of those mid and late 70s winters indicates that collectively they were the worst winters uh, we've ever seen in, for instance, the Chicago and Milwaukee areas. Uh, and that's dating back into the late 1800s. Extreme cold. Oh, we had 90 degree below zero wind chills on occasion. Now, as 1979 began, Chicago was hit with its biggest onslaught yet. A nine inch snowstorm buried the city on New Year's Eve. Over the next two weeks, below zero temperatures kept city crews from being able to dig Chicago out. It didn't help that the city's government wasn't the well-oiled machine that it had been under Mayor Daley. I think the machine was starting to disintegrate by this stage. If you recall, Mayor Daley died in December of 1976. He had an iron hand on how things went. So he had an interim period there of over two years where you were not leaderless, but you didn't have a strong leader like Richard Daley. Daley's successor, Michael Bolandic, was a longtime Democratic loyalist. But Daly's image loomed over the city and over Mayor Belandic. Michael Belandic was uh, a man who was not really a public man. He was a manager. He was a very intelligent man, a very thoughtful man. Uh, but he did not know how to handle the very public, open role of being a mayor. Belandic was facing a challenge in the upcoming primary election from Jane Byrne, also a longtime Democratic loyalist but her chances of beating a machine-backed incumbent mayor were slim at best. Snowball's chance in hell, to be very blunt. I think she was a real underdog. But winter began to work for Jane Byrne. Chicago, still reeling from the New Year's Eve storm, was hit with another crippling 19-inch snowfall on January 12th. Sub-zero temperatures followed in its wake. The city's already troubled attempts to get streets cleared and trains running now collapsed. Streets weren't plowed. 
commuters waited on windy L platforms in sub-zero weather for trains that never came. Even by Chicago standards, this was a miserable winter. But it was the city government's failure to deal with the snow that turned annoyance into anger. I remember standing on Lawrence Avenue one night, bitterly cold. The snow plows were out there trying to remove from the crowd. Residents were upset. You could see they were angry. Well, you finally come there hollering at the city streets in San Cruz. You're finally here. What took so long? You could see there was rebellion in the air. There was snow after snow, freeze after freeze, uh, going through this ice. Uh, people frustrated, uh, angry. They were probably angry at their own households and no way to vent this except they finally did politically. I think they could do a better job if Mayor Daley was still alive, a lot better. I think they should leave the snow on the ground and distribute toboggans. The city's rage at the snow was epitomized by the bizarre story of a frustrated snowplow driver. Two weeks after the January 12th blizzard, at the end of an 18-hour shift, the driver went on a rampage. He drove his plow into 34 cars, leaving one man dead and five injured. He told arresting officers, I hate my job. I want to see my kids. Chicago's murder rate was 69% higher that month than it had been a year before. Every attempt by the city to solve its problems seemed to backfire. What Mike Belandic's administration failed to do was to remind Chicagoans that a lot of this effort would depend upon them making a contribution as well. Don't just sit back and wait for the city to come to the rescue. Grab a shovel. Belandic didn't do that. To get streets clear for plows, Belandic told Chicagoans to move their cars to city parking lots. But those lots turned out to be under three feet of snow. To get the L running more efficiently, the Transit Authority authorized trains to skip stops. And so the stops that they uh, skipped were the stops in the heart of the black community. And so here are black workers, middle class, lower class, upper class, whatever, waiting. And the trains are going by them. What in the world is going on? They're waiting, and they'd see the train go by and wouldn't stop for them. How would you feel? Angry would put it mildly. A year before, the city had paid $90,000 to a consulting firm for an updated snow emergency plan. But the so-called consultant turned out to be a machine insider, and his report was nowhere to be found. And they finally said, oh, there's been a report. Here it is. But I remember that the night the snow report got put into my hands, the paper still felt warm because it had just come off the copy machines. It was a report literally thrown together that never existed when the blizzard occurred. Heads rolled at City Hall. Mayor Belandic appointed a new director of the Snow Command, and a week later, the Chicago Tribune reported that he was connected to the Mafia. As columnist Mike Royko put it, in no other city would a record snowfall eventually be revealed to have a crime syndicate connection. All these political missteps became fodder for the mayoral campaign of Jane Byrne. No one could stop the snow, but good planning can prevent the collapse of public transportation and clean the city up fast. I'm Jane Byrne, Commissioner of Consumer Sales under the late Mayor Daley. Nothing seems to be working the way it used to. I think it's time to get Chicago working again for you. Vote for Jane Byrne in the Democratic primary. Two months earlier, Jane Byrne had been an underdog without a chance. On February 10th, Byrne beat Belandic in the primary, the first person to defeat the Chicago machine candidate for mayor in more than 60 years. In Chicago, the winner of the Democratic primary always won the general election, and in April, Byrne took office with 82% of the vote. The lesson of the 1979 blizzard was not lost on Byrne's successors. People in this city expect this from the city government. When the white stuff begins to fall, get the plows out, 
get the salt trucks out. A massive approach, a massive attack is needed. If not, I'm going to vote you out of office. In January 1999, Chicago was socked by a blizzard even greater than the 1979 storm. Mayor Richard M. Daley, whose father had been mayor during the 1967 storm, made snow removal a priority. Daley made sure not to make too many promises. Two months after the blizzard, Daley was re-elected in a landslide, just as his father had been after the 1967 storm. We expect an awful lot from our governments. We expect no interruption in our normal daily routine, uh, thanks to uh, the most abhorrent forms of weather. Uh, the fact is, these are extreme events. Uh, the rarity of their occurrence underscores that. And the fact is, we've got to understand that we have been horribly assaulted by nature in these snowstorms. In the days of the prairie homesteaders, Anyone caught in a blizzard had only one concern, survival. Advances in meteorology seem to have turned blizzards from killers into inconveniences. But the lesson of history's great blizzards is clear. No precautions can stop the force of these winter storms. And to ignore their power is to invite disaster. This has been a Wayne Michelson presentation. This is VOA, a Michelson Broadcast Service.